triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Who in your life taught you to do something you really wanted to learn? Possibly something you love to do. I think in our lives we have those people that are willing to spend the time with us to pass on their wisdom, their knowledge, practical application, and teach us to do something that we love to do. It could be our parents or relative, coaches, educators, friends, supervisors, you name it. Those mentors that set aside their own precious time to share who they are and what they do with us. Think of those folks and give thanks for them today for their sharing of their time with you and their, and their wisdom. I'm thankful, and I, and I kind of chuckle at one of the most interesting mentors I had in my lifetime. I love to learn from people, but when I was 10 years old, my mentor was Mr. T.L. Stahl. He was a pigeon racer. You ever heard of pigeon racing? Yeah. So I had heard about him in the neighborhood, and I'd seen his birds, his flock of birds flying around, and one day, I was fascinated, but one day I found one of his birds that met an early demise, and I noticed that it had a band on the leg, and I thought, this is my chance to meet him. So I went running down to his house and bravely knocked on his door and told him about his bird. He went down and saw it, and he had scooped it up and explained, yes, he must have hit a wire or something, but then he took me back and showed me his pigeon lofts with his hundreds of birds. And he talked about pigeon racing, that people would drive. There was a whole group of people that would drive their birds out and release them. And they had special clocks. And when the bird got home, they would stamp the time and, and have a special band. And, and the winner got a trophy. And I was like totally enamored of it. Every day after school, I'd run over there and hear, hear more about pigeon racing. I literally sat at the guy's feet. He was, Mr. Stahl was a wiry guy with kind of a handlebar mustache that sm chain smoked unfiltered camels. <laughs> and he would sit on the back stoop of his house and I would s truly sit at his feet and he would talk about this is how you do, you know, this is a young bird and this is how you train him to fly around. And, and then he would sprinkle his stories about pigeon racing with life advice, like he was the first one to tell me when I complained about some boy hitting me at school that no, it doesn't mean he doesn't like you. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. And, and he would say things like, you know, don't let your birds out too late. Oh, by then, my poor mother, by the end of about a year, I had a loft full of over 200 pigeons. I was a pigeon racer. He would tell me, don't let your birds out too close to dusk or they'll get caught out after night. And remember to study for a profession where you can get a job, but don't forget the liter liberal arts. I hope he's proud of me. Um, the liberal arts actually worked for me. Um, and yeah, so he was, he, was, he was a very wonderful teacher in my life. And I remember the first pigeon race I ever won. I came in and all the men, yes, it was a group of men and me and my poor mother sitting there when we were all looking at our, our results of our birds coming in and they calculated the airline miles to my house and yes, I won. And I heard one of the guys say, well, TL, your protege won the race. And I thought, what's a protege? And I went home, I was 11, went home, and yes, I pulled a real dictionary off the shelf, and I looked up the word protege, and I remember feeling like, I like that. I am a protege. So I, I, I revisited it. I, I went online on Merriam-Webster, and I looked up the, the, the definition of protege. No wonder I liked it. One who is protected, protected, or trained, or whose career is furthered by a person of experience prominence or influence, protected by and trained by. And at Epiphany in 2020, we are focusing this year on discipleship. And yes, Jesus is way more than a teacher and a mentor, 
But I think if we might push ourselves to see ourselves as protégés of Jesus, it might help us to engage as disciples in a deeper way. Because the claim of the gospel is that there is one mentor, one person who we should follow, one person that we should learn from above all other people, and that's Jesus Christ. So when we look at today's gospel and see Jesus' first day of ministry, we find out more about this person that we say we want to be pro pro their pro his protégés. And we can see who he is. It's just a first glimpse that readers of Matthew as hearers of Matthew gets. But we can figure out a little bit about who this guy is, Jesus. First of all, he's the fulfillment of prophecy. He's the fulfillment of prophecy. Second, he brings with him the kingdom of heaven. He ushers in the kingdom of heaven. And finally, he calls folks to learn from him. He's the fulfillment of prophets. He brings with him the kingdom of heaven, and he calls others to learn from him. So what we have in Matthew's gospel is what happens right after he's been baptized and he goes into the wilderness, he overcomes temptation, and then he starts his ministry. But um, John has been arrested, and we hear something interesting in the beginning. It's on page three of your bulletin. We hear that now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Well, what, what was this prophecy? Fortunately, it's not just written here in the gospel, our first reading, the church provides that passage from Isaiah 9, and if we turn to page 1 in our bulletin, we can see that even though it had been a land of gloom and anguish, a land of darkness, something is going to change. There will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. We need to know context here a little bit, I think. Um, ancient Israel was divided into areas that corresponded to the 12 tribes of Israel, meaning that, that all those 12 sons of Jacob, those names became tribes of Israel, I mean, yeah, tribes, they became regions of Israel, and Zebulun and Naphtali were in the northern part, and in 9th century BC, the Assyrians came in and evaded and brought darkness upon the land. And remember, the prophet had said that, that Israel was to be a light to everyone, to all nations, so when they were invaded, darkness fell upon the land, but this prophecy is saying light is going to come to that area. And did that happen in Isaiah's time? No. But this is the strange claim of Matthew. He has Jewish hearers, so this is going to make all the difference in the world that this Messiah this is coming from an going to an unexpected place into a place of darkness. What does that tell us as disciples? It tells us that as protégés, we follow one who is not going to avoid the dark and messy places in our lives and in the lives of others. So when we day by day begin to be protégés of Jesus Christ, we can expect that the darkness in our lives, those things that challenge us, those things that we haven't addressed or that we might be ashamed of or frustrated with, he's going to go right into those darkest areas if we really follow him. And then it can tell us as protégés of Jesus that we can expect that if we follow him, we're going to have to go into messy places ourselves. That we are not to shy away from conflict or fear or folks who are hurting or folks who may not be behaving like we think they should behave, but that as protégés that we are bringing that light with us because we are following him into those areas. The light comes and the light heals. We hear that, that Jesus begins healing people after he calls his first disciples. When we 
hear the gospel today, we hear that he calls those first, that first group of disciples and then that light is shining on people and heals people. This is because Jesus brings with him, and this is the second thing, the kingdom of heaven. That is the second thing. He begins to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. This is the first glimpse we get of, of Jesus' mission of who this Jesus is, that God's project in the person of Jesus Christ is not, as N.T. Wright has said, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to populate earth with the very life of heaven. So this is the first glimpse that when we follow him, we are entering into a kingdom life, and he is preparing his disciples because in Matthew, the kingdom life challenges us deeply in Sermon on the Mount. So he's called these folks into the kingdom to learn the challenging gospel that will bring life, that enables us to live in life in all its fullness. John Stott said the gospel is both gift and demand. Both gift and demand. What is the demand in our gospel today? Follow me. That's the demand. Follow me. You have to go somewhere with me. Follow me. Be my protege. I will teach you. I'm willing to spend all the time I have with you to teach you about the kingdom. But those nets they drop, doesn't that astound you? I guess when you're in the presence, face to face in the light, you can't help but drop your net. Not everybody has those moments where we just throw it all away and have a, have a vivid encounter with Christ, but we have the ability to encounter Christ every single day of our lives that will help us more and more to put Jesus first. So everything else that we love to do, that we're gifted with, falls into place. He's the ultimate mentor because everything that he has given us, every gift that we have is used for his glory. Put me first. Put me first, and then the other one, we talked about this last week, travel together. He doesn't just call one person. He calls a group of people. Jesus is forming a new community, and that community is a church. And we get to live together. We get to travel together. And it's glorious and hard and weird in an age where we're separated, and we can hide, can't we? We can be isolated and technologically connected and nobody knows really who we are. It's tempting, isn't it? It's really tempting. But if we're really following Jesus, we come together and we encounter him together. Look, this is the body of Christ. You're in the presence of the risen Lord. This is the body of Christ. That's how we encounter him. We encounter him by worshiping him. His grace breaks That praise breaks back in waves of grace upon us, and then we hear his word, and then we receive his very life in the sacrament, travel together. It makes a difference. That's the demand. It sounds more like a gift. That's the demand. Put me first, travel together, be my protege, and then the gift of the gospel. Follow me, and I will what? Make you fish for people. You are fishermen. I'm not going to annihilate who you are. I'm going to magnify who you are. I'm going to take every good thing about you and elevate it. That's what following Jesus does. It's this graceful elevation of the soul into the image of the mentor, Jesus Christ. As protégés, if we follow him day by day, week by week, month by month, and persevere, even when we don't see him, even when we don't feel him, we show up. We are gracefully elevated into his image, and he is the gatherer. See, he's gathered this little group of people, and in Matthew, what's one of the last things that Jesus says to his group of protégés? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I'll make you fisher of people. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, sharing our time, Sharing our time, it's a stewardship of our lives, isn't it? Sharing our time to share our very best wisdom and experience, our lives. 
baptizing them, teaching them all I, to observe all I have commanded, and I am with you. Remember this. I am with you to the ends of the age. You know that protection of the protege in that definition? I am with you to the end of the age. Above all these things we do, worship, encountering the word, Bible study, being in fellowship, prayer is essential. Prayer is essential because that's the time we really actually sit at Jesus' feet and listen for him and listen to him. And that's what enables us to grow in our discipleship and come back together. Now, I hear over and over how busy we are. We have made ourselves busy. The, the culture has pressed busyness upon us. We are busy people. We have a lot on our schedule. So is a year of discipleship just going to put another thing on our list? Another thing to do spiritually? This is not what Jesus is talking about when he calls his disciples. You see, when, when we open our hearts and our minds to the living God in Christ Jesus and follow him, it, it's things that used to confuse us become second nature. Everything gets lighter. If you find yourself with too many church things to do, that's not what this gospel is saying. This gospel is saying that follow me and I will set you free and, and I will give you more time than you thought you ever had. When I share my time with you, Jesus says, your time is multiplied. Later in Matthew, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, as we kind of consider all those people who have been willing to share their time with us in our lives to teach us to do the things we need to do or the things we love to do, let's refocus. Let's look to Jesus and make him the one we follow above all others if we do we will grow deeper in his love and be equipped to share that love with others amen